This Sunday, uphill battle. I'm not giving up this fight. Nikki Haley vows to fight on after losing the GOP primary in her home state. I know 40% is not 50%. But I also know 40% is not some tiny group. While Donald Trump says he can't wait for the general election to start. I just wish we could do it quicker. Nine months is a long time. How long will Haley stay in the race? I'll talk to Republican Congressman Byron Donalds of Florida, who is strongly backing Trump. Plus, fertility fight. Alabama's Supreme Court rules that frozen embryos created through IVF are considered children, leading fertility clinics in the state to pause procedures. Access to reproductive health care through IVF is being taken from countless individuals and families. Embryos to me are babies. What will be the legal and political impact? I'll talk to Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom of California. And Ukraine's future. The war in Ukraine reaches the two-year mark. You can't walk away now. And that's what Putin is betting on. But the thing you care most about is a conflict 6,000 miles away. You should not be a leader of this country. What will happen if the U.S. pulls back support? I'll speak with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Joining me for insight and analysis are NBC Chief Political Analyst Chuck Todd, NBC News Washington Correspondent Yamish Alcindor, former Obama White House Senior Advisor Stephanie Cutter, and Lonnie Chen, a fellow at the Hoover Institution. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Kristen Welker. Good Sunday morning. Former President Donald Trump is solidifying his grip on the Republican nomination. After beating Nikki Haley in the Midwest, the Northeast, the West, and now the South. Trump delivering a crushing blow to Haley in her home state on Saturday, trouncing her by nearly 20 points with nearly 60 percent of the vote. The former president dominating nearly every key group in the South Carolina Republican primary electorate, according to NBC News exit poll results. Trump now setting his sights squarely on the general election. In certain countries, you're allowed to call your election date. If I had the right to do it, I'd do it tomorrow. I'd say we're having an election tomorrow. More than 60 percent of South Carolina Republican primary voters said in exit polls they would consider Trump fit to be president even if he was convicted of a crime. But Nikki Haley defiant, vowing to stay in the race through Super Tuesday, but not saying what will happen after that. I'm going to count it. I know 40 percent is not 50 (laughs) percent. But I also know 40 percent is not some tiny group. In the next 10 days, another 21 states and territories will speak. They have the right to a real choice. Not a Soviet-style election with only one candidate. As former President Trump looks to a likely general election rematch with President Biden, a growing chorus of his aides and allies tell NBC News they want him to fixate less on personal grievances and instead focus on hitting President Biden and unifying the Republican Party. The challenges of that were on display on Friday night during a speech at the Black Conservative Federation's annual gala in South Carolina. Trump griped about his legal troubles, including four indictments, complaining of discrimination. I got indicted a second time and a third time and a fourth time. And a lot of people said that that's why the black people like me, because they have been hurt so badly and discriminated against. And they actually viewed me as I'm being discriminated against. We'll get to all of it later this hour, but we begin with the two-year anniversary of the war in Ukraine. On Saturday, Ukrainian President Zelensky promised his country would win the war despite a series of setbacks, saying we are 730 days closer to victory. Joining me now is National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Jake, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thanks for having me. So let's start right there in Ukraine. Ukrainian fighters 
have been dying. They've been running out of ammunition. Is this war in Ukraine a stalemate, Jake, or does Russia now have the upper hand? Well, first, Kristen, let's take a step back. We've just hit the two-year anniversary since this brutal invasion began. And when it began, most people on your show predicted that it'd be over in a week or two. Most people in the U.S. government predicted it'd be over in a week or two. Two years later, the capital of Ukraine, Kyiv, stands, the country stands proud and free and resisting Russian aggression. So we need to understand that actually Ukraine has in many ways succeeded in thwarting the fundamental objective of Vladimir Putin, which was to subjugate the country of Ukraine. Now, Ukraine has also taken back roughly half the territory that Russia occupied in the early months of the war. We are looking at some setbacks, including in recent days, because Ukraine didn't have enough ammunition to defend the town of Evdivka in the east. But at the end of the day, Ukraine still has the capacity, if we provide them the tools and resources they need, to be able to prevail in this war. And it is up to us, the United States and our allies and partners, to deliver on our commitments. And that's why it's so important that Congress act. And we are going to talk about that fight over the aid in just a moment. But I want to ask you big picture. Does the United States still think that Ukraine can win this war militarily? Of course, Ukraine can win. Of course, Ukraine has already succeeded militarily in one of the most profound objectives it had, which was to keep the country from falling into Russian hands. It has already done that. And Ukraine can go further in retaking territory that Russia has occupied, ensuring Russia fails and ensuring Ukraine prevails. But it can only do so if it has the tools that it needs. And that is why the United States needs to deliver yeah. the aid package that passed on a massive bipartisan vote in the Senate. The House needs to step up and pass that bill. Well, with aid stalled in the House, I had an opportunity to speak to the U.K. Foreign Secretary David Cameron, and I asked him what he thinks President Biden can do on his own. Take a look at that answer. I think what, um, what Britain has shown, I'm not saying we get everything right, we make mistakes, but right at the start of this conflict, we took the view we were going to back Ukraine and back Zelensky as much as we could. So we gave them the anti-tank weapons. We gave them the tanks. We gave them the long-range artillery. And on every occasion, there were people saying, including some of the United States, saying, look, this is in danger of escalating. And I don't think it was in danger of escalating the conflict. What we were doing was giving Ukraine the weaponry they need to fight off the Russians. And I think that is non-escalatory. I think it's perfectly fair to back a country in its self-defense. And I think that the more that the American administration can see that that's, that, that works, that, that others have done it, America is doing it now with the long-range artillery, and I would urge the Pentagon and the president to you know, err on the side of doing more. Jake, is President Biden out of options, or is there more he can do on his own? Well, it comes down to basic arithmetic. We need money to be able to provide the weapons to Ukraine. We don't have the money. Only Congress can provide the money. So that's the reality. And that's why the urgency of, <coughs> excuse me, of Congress passing this bill is so profound. And it's why this ultimately comes down to a simple decision for one man, Speaker Johnson. If there were an up or down vote in, this, in the House, this would pass on a bipartisan basis. So Speaker Johnson needs to decide, will he allow that vote to go forward? If he does, Ukraine will get what he needs. If he doesn't, then the United States will not have the resources necessary to give Ukraine the kinds of tools and capacities that it needs. That's what this comes down to. And that is the moment that we are at right now. Jake, what do you say to Speaker Johnson? What do you say to House Republicans who say they don't think more taxpayer dollars should be spent on the war in Ukraine until they have a clear understanding of the strategy and what victory looks like there. So I've personally gone up and briefed the speaker and other members. Uh, Secretary Austin, Secretary Blinken, our intelligence community have all gone up. We've laid out in writing how we look at the strategy for Ukraine to prevail and for Russia to fail in this. We've gotten good feedback from the House on that. I don't think the question at this point is about the strategy. And I don't think the question is about whether there is an overwhelming bipartisan vote in the House waiting to happen. The question now is about politics. Will 
Speaker Johnson bust through the politics in his caucus to put this vote on the floor. If he does, the resources will flow. And we have answered and engaged on the questions relative to the strategy. We feel that we are in a good place on that. Now it comes down to a simple uh, right, right or left turn. You know, one way is towards a vote that delivers Ukraine what it needs. The other way is towards an outcome that Vladimir Putin would love to see, which is the United States not stepping up to its responsibility. Let me ask you about Russia as it relates to our next election. As you know, the intelligence community has said that in 2016 and 2020, Russia interfered in the United States presidential elections. Are there concerns or is there even evidence that Russia is planning to interfere in the 2024 election, Jake? I can't speak to evidence today, but I can tell you, of course, there are concerns. There is a history here in presidential elections uh, by the Russian Federation, by its intelligence services. And there's plenty of reason uh, to be concerned. And this is not about politics. This is about national security. It is about a foreign country, a foreign adversary seeking uh, to manipulate the politics and democracy of the United States of America. We are going to be vigilant about that, and we will engage the Congress on a bipartisan basis because this should be above and beyond politics. Let me ask you about Israel. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday announced that he will convene a cabinet meeting at the beginning of this week to approve the operational plans for action in Rafah, including the evacuation, he says, of the civilian population there. Has the president seen this plan? Has he been briefed on it? He has not. And beyond that, Kristen, we have been very clear about our view here. We're talking about more than a million people who have been pushed into this small space in Gaza because of military operations elsewhere. It's also the area where all of the humanitarian assistance comes into Gaza to serve all of Gaza. And so we've been clear that we do not believe that an operation, a mil major military operation, should proceed in Rafah unless there is a clear and executable plan to protect those civilians, to get them to safety, and to feed, clothe, and house them. And we have not seen a plan like that. Well, is the president willing to withhold weapon sales until he does see the plan? What's he willing to do in terms of leverage here? So I'm, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals because at this time, what we are doing is telling our Israeli counterparts privately, just as we are saying publicly, uh, that we believe that this operation should not go forward until or unless we see that. We haven't seen it, but we're waiting to hear from the Israelis on that front. All right. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, thank you very much for being here today. We really appreciate it. And still ahead, we dive into the 2024 race with Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom of California. But when we come back, will Donald Trump change his strategy as he pivots to the general election? Republican Congressman Byron Donalds joins me next. Welcome back. As former President Donald Trump solidifies his hold on the Republican nomination, NBC News has learned that Trump allies are encouraging him to pivot to a general election message. Joining me now is a top Trump surrogate who has also been mentioned as a potential running mate, including on Friday night, Republican Congressman Byron Donalds of Florida. Congressman Donalds, welcome back to Meet the Press. It's good to be back with you. Thanks for having me on. Well, it is great to have you, Congressman. And on Friday, you introduced Donald Trump at a group of black conservatives. He made a number of headline making comments, including this one. Take a look. I got indicted a second time and a third time and a fourth time. And a lot of people said that that's why the black people like me, because they have been hurt so badly and discriminated against. And they actually viewed me as I'm being discriminated against. Congressman, it sounds like Donald Trump was implying that he can win black voters because they get indicted all the time, too. Is that what he was saying? Well, I think it's in part of that. It's part of it, Kristen. Look, the, the, it was a great night, Friday night in Columbia, South Carolina. The president was really just enjoying himself. It was a great celebration for black conservatives across our country. But let's be very clear. Our economy is a mess. Our border is completely unsecured. These things are causes of major concerns for black voters like it is for every voter in our country. But then when you layer on the fact that, yes, this is political persecution from the Department of Justice and from 
radical DAs throughout our country. This is something similar that black people had to deal with the, with the justice system themselves. And so their, their look of it is real simple. Well, dang, if the government's going after him with foolishness, uh, he can't be that bad, especially considering the fact that Joe Biden is terrible at his job. Well, con Congressman, let's just be clear. All four indictments against former President Trump were brought by grand juries. There is no evidence that the indictments are political in nature. But let me stick to the question here. Let me get you to respond to Biden campaign co-chair and former Congressman Cedric Richmond, who said this about his comments. Donald Trump claiming that black Americans will support him because of his criminal charges is insulting. It's moronic and it's just plain racist. How do you respond to that charge that it's just plain racist? What I would say is that Cedric is trying to play politics and use racial politics even now as we get into the general election. That's one. Number two, like I said at the top, the number one reason why minority voters in our country want to support Donald Trump is because he did the job of president. He did a great job as president. Our country was secure. The economy was great. These are all things that Donald Trump talked about Friday night. He also did talk about the indictments. What Americans don't want to see, especially black Americans and anybody else, they don't want to see a political politicized justice department. They don't want to see a two-tier system of justice. They want justice to be followed. They want lady justice to be blind. That's what the American people well, want. That's what black voters want. That's what everybody wants. Again, there's no evidence that the indictments against him are politicized. But sticking to this question, were you offended at all by his comments, Congressman? No, I wasn't, because I understood what the president was talking about. And like I've, I've said now for the third time, he talked about all the reasons why minority voters want to support him. And, Kristen, let me push back a little bit. You have to acknowledge the fact that now that the Robert Hur report has come out about Joe Biden's misuse of classified information, which is a violation of the Espionage Act, he had no rights to any of those documents when he was a senator Con or vice president. Yet there are no charges against against vice yeah, against President but, but Biden. But President Trump is under Congressman prosecution. To, on hold now. on, I have, to, know that I have, I have to hit the all. pause button for one minute, Congressman, because the her report was very clear sure. that there was not enough evidence to bring charges against President Biden, and that ultimately Kristen, there was not I enough. That is what the her report said, not, Congressman. That no, is exactly no, 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 what no. the her report said. The, yes, it the, is. It the said the that there wasn't act is enough. Clear. The there wasn't enough evidence to bring clear. You cannot charges. possess those those documents. As a senator or a vice president, you have no right to those documents. As a senator or a vice president, uh, they must remain in a secure facility. Joe Biden took them from a skiff. That's a violation of the Espionage right. Act, and period. If, okay. All right. Bottom line, though, her himself said there wasn't enough evidence to bring charges. Let's move on to this next topic, though. I want to talk about the Alabama IVF ruling. This week, you said that you agreed with mm. the state Supreme Court's decision that embryos are children. I just want to put a fine point on this. Do you support IVF as it is practiced in the United States, which involves the production of embryos that are sometimes destroyed or even donated if they're unused? Well, first, I do support IVF because I have a, several friends that have gone through that procedure. It has made their their families whole. It's allowed them to have children. Their children are beautiful. They're wonderful. I totally support the procedure. Number two, when uh, when the NBC reporter asked me that question, I was in the middle of a hallway. I heard the tail end of it. I didn't hear about the Alabama ruling. It was about, do I support that embryos are, are should be protected as life? Look, embryos are important to the production of life. We all come from embryos. That's what I said because I heard half her question. But do I support the IVF procedure? 100% I do. It should be made available. And I believe, as President Trump has also said, we really want the Alabama legislature to make sure that that procedure is protected for families who do struggle with having children. That helps them uh, actually create great families, which is what our country desperately needs. Uh, so uh, just to be very clear, though, if you believe that embryos are children, do you think they should be treated as people with all the same legal rights as people? Well, I think now you're getting to a personhood argument, and this is where a lot of the details in legislation, not just court rulings, are important. I believe that this is something that the legislatures have to make sure they weigh and walk themselves through. The IVF procedure is very important to a lot of couples in our country. It should be protected. I agree with President Trump on that. But when we get into these, these conversations, it's important to delineate from what just one judge might say versus what a legislature and a governor will decide 
when they go through the legislative process. And you raise the point that President Trump is calling for lawmakers in Alabama to take action. There is also federal legislation that is being proposed. Will you support that with, that would protect IVF services at the federal level? Like any any type of bill that gets drafted on Capitol Hill, I want to see the devil in the details. But yes, I could broadly, I feel I could broadly support that because, like I said, IVF is something that is so critical to a lot of couples. It helps them breed great families. Our country needs that. All right, let me ask you now about Ukraine and the aid that is pending on Capitol Hill at a town hall in January of 2022. You said that America needed to be engaged in Ukraine because, quote, if you essentially allow the bully to bully, you're going to be drawn into a broader conflict you do not want to be a part of. Today, you oppose additional aid to Ukraine. What changed, Congressman? Mm. My opposition has been very simple. Joe Biden needs to secure our country. The first job of the federal government is to secure the nation, secure our borders. He has failed in that. We are going to have 10 million migrants come into our country at the end of his first term just because he wants to have an open border strategy. That doesn't help our, our country. And so many citizens are saying, why are we sending billions of dollars to protect Ukraine while our country remains open? So my message has been clear. I agree with the speaker. You want to talk Ukraine funding? Let's talk about it. But you got to secure Secure America first. But Co Congressman, you had the opportunity to take significant actions to secure the border. The Senate came up with a deal that some veteran senators was the best deal they'd seen to secure the border. It didn't even include demands by Democrats for a path to citizenship. For example, the Border Patrol Union even endorsed it. How can you make that argument when you oppose that and when Republicans oppose that in the House? Oh, it's very easy because it was a terrible deal. That bill would have codified all the actions of Joe Biden when he became president. There would have been no stop to the flow of migrants going into Detroit, but Chicago, Denver, New York, etc. It wouldn't have fixed anything, Kristen. It was a terrible deal. And by the way, it didn't even pass the Senate. So if it doesn't pass the chamber of, of, of Congress, it is no but, deal. But, but Congress, the border, Congressman, the Border Patrol unit that endorsed Former President Trump also endorsed this plan. And again, so did a lot of your Republican colleagues on the Senate side who said this is as good as it's going to get. So can you really say you did everything and that you have done everything possible for the border when you've opposed that deal? In the House, we passed H.R. 2. It is the most robust border security package ever to pass a chamber of Congress. And I stress, Kristen, H.R. 2 has passed the House. The Senate deal did not pass the Senate. Uh, Chuck Schumer in the Senate won't even take it up for debate. He ignores it. That's on Chuck Schumer. But at the core of this entire question, the yeah. number one job is to secure the country. Joe Biden doesn't even need legislation to secure the country. He could do that right now. He can undo all of his executive well, orders that he put into place when he became president of the United States. Congressman, That's what created the crisis that we have today. Congressman, as you know, executive orders often get tied up in the courts. That's what happened under former President Trump. But let, let me ask you big picture, because the government is careening toward another potential shutdown in just days. Are you willing to shut down the government over border security? And I believe Joe Biden is willing to shut down. But will you? What are you security. willing to do? What like are you said, willing to do? A couple but days Congressman, ago, what are you Kristen, willing to Kristen, do? Kristen, let me be clear. I'm willing to fund the government as long as our border is secure. The first job of the government is to secure the border. Any business that provides a service, if they don't give you the service, do you give them money? The answer is no. Kristen, you don't even do that. So we have to be honest with the American people. The government has a responsibility. Our cities are overrun. Our schools are overrun. Our shelters are overrun. And Joe Biden allows the disaster to continue. Kristen, let me add this wrinkle. There are young women who are sold into sex slavery by the drug cartels so, every single day. Yeah. Joe Biden allows it to occur. That is un-American. It is not humane. Our border must be secured. Period. So, Congressman, just yes or no, and of course the Biden administration is working on executive actions as we speak, but just yes or no, would you vote to shut down the government if you did not see a border security plan in the package? Just yes or no. 
I will not be voting for any funding if the border is not secured. Okay. Any, anything I vote for has to secure our border, and the president should agree to that. That's, simple, that's common sense for a nation like America. All right. Congressman Donald, thank you so much for your time today and your perspective. We really appreciate it. And when we come back, Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom of California and his thoughts on the 2024 race. Stay with us. Welcome back. The latest battle over abortion in the wake of Roe v. Wade is happening in Alabama, where, as we noted earlier, the state Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos are legally children and that people can be held liable for destroying them, setting off a scramble with implications for IVF and reproductive rights. On Saturday, I sat down with California Governor Gavin Newsom. His PAC is going up this week with a provocative new ad in Tennessee, where a bill has been proposed that would punish adults assisting minors seeking out-of-state abortions. Trump Republicans want to criminalize young women who travel to receive the reproductive care they need. Don't let them hold Tennessee women hostage. I began by asking Newsom what President Biden should do to respond to the Alabama ruling. He's speaking with clarity, moral clarity, forcefully. The vice president speaking with moral clarity, forcefully all across this country. Uh, we've defined the lines of this debate. We've been on the offense, not on the defense. The Republican Party is on the defense on this issue. You saw that with the flip-flops of Haley. You see that in terms of Trump, though he's still trying to figure out exactly his position because he's out there celebrating the fact he created these conditions in the first place. But here's the point I want to make, and that's what this ad's about. The conditions are much more pernicious than they even appear. These guys are not just restricting the rights of self-determination to bear a child for a young, child, a young woman, but they're also determining their fate as it relates to their future in life by saying they can't even travel. Mm -hmm. These travel restrictions modeled after a version that passed in Idaho is now being proposed in Tennessee, in Oklahoma, in Mississippi. The AG himself of Alabama wants to criminalize travel not just for children, but for adults seeking reproductive care. That's how serious this moment is, and we need to be even more aggressive, I would argue, and that's what this ad represents. Given the seriousness of this moment that you have just laid out, going back to the question, is there a unilateral, an executive action yeah. that you think President Biden should be taking to deal with the IVF piece of this, and then, as you say, the abortion travel ban piece I have of no, this. There's no daylight in their efforts and the work they're doing, and they are investigating exactly where their position can land in terms of the laws itself. But at the end of the day, this is a serious threat, not just what's happening in Alabama, regardless of what Trump tweets out saying the legislature in Alabama should do about something about this. I worry about the United States Supreme Court that, again, set the tone and tenor for the debate we're having today. And again, it's not just a war on travel. It's not just a war on reproductive health care. It's also a war on women more broadly to Fine, including, as we know, contraceptives. You talk about the Republican position on this. NBC News has confirmed that the GOP frontrunner, Donald Trump, has told people privately that he is uh, considering supporting a 16-week federal <laughs> ban that would include exceptions. Yeah. You've been clear, and here again today, yeah. you're supporting generous for of them rights. to include exceptions. What a kind soul. In 16 well, weeks, it's because it's an even number? Well, I mean, this, I, is, this I, is un these people aren't serious, so he supports this. This is what he said. He supports a national ban. And if you're Lindsey Graham and others, they're going to bring that down well below 16. He will sign a national ban. You want to understand the contours of this debate that we will be having over the next nine months, ironically nine months, between now and November, and the consequences of Democratic Party not succeeding in Biden's reelection? Just consider the fact that he said that, 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 that part out loud. We know that there are reports that former President Obama warned President Biden not to underestimate Trump. Never. Do you believe that Democrats are underestimating Trump no. in this moment, his strength no. potentially in a well, general election? I think he's election? weakness masquerading as strength. I, I think he's more unhinged. He's, more, he's less interesting than he was even a few years ago. I mean, you've heard his comments just this week, uh, uh, I mean, more just overt racist comments that he's made. It's just extraordinary how 
quickly he is unraveling in real time, including just on basic policy issues like repealing Obamacare, mm. which is overwhelmingly supported, the highest ACA uh, enrollment that we've seen in decades, uh, rather in years and years, just the last few weeks. So the reality at the end of the day, he's unhinged. He's a much weaker cannon than he was a few years ago. Democrats are stronger. We're winning 18, 20, 22, 23. You yeah. saw in New York 3. We continue to win. We continue to outperform. And Donald Trump is a big part of that. Uh, and he's going to be the nominee of the Republican Party. And yet, Governor, there are some pretty stark numbers that you're facing. 76 percent of voters say they have real concerns about President Biden's ability to serve a second term. Do you think it's responsible for Democrats to put him at the top of the ticket, given those concerns? Responsible. I revere his record. I, I mean, this, what he's done in three years has been a master class, close to 15 million jobs. That's eight times more than the last three Republican presidents combined. The economy is booming. Inflation is cooling. It's 0.6 percent more than it was in the summer of 2020 at just 3.1 percent. Wait a second. We have American manufacturing coming back home all because of Biden's wisdom, because of his temperance, his yeah. capacity to lead in a bipartisan manner, which is an underrepresented point. And so I have great confidence moving forward. So the answer is absolutely all in in terms of the next four years the, with Joe Biden. These voters, though, are not complaining about his record. They're talking about concerns about his ability to beat Trump, who you've called a, a lightning, a I'm threat, essentially, to the democracy. But in, in private, we've heard a lot of, well, we've heard a lot of his allies say publicly in private, he is strong, he's in command, yeah. he's forceful. Does he need to do more to show? I think he's doing that? everything he needs to do. I mean, he's got an extraordinary record. He's doing everything he needs to do on Ukraine at the moment. He's doing everything he needs to do uh, to reconcile and wrestle some common sense as it relates to a bipartisan approach to address the issue of the border, uh, where the Republicans couldn't take yes for an answer yeah. uh, because they don't want to make that a political issue. Uh, he is leading. And so, no, from my humble perspective, not only the last three years have been extraordinary, I've been out with, as you know, on the campaign drive. I was just out in California. I've seen him up close. I've seen him from far. But here's my point. It's because of his age that he's been so successful. It's because of the wisdom and the character that's developed over years that we have the Chips and Science Act, the Infrastructure Bill and the PACT Act and the Safer Communities Act. And because we've seen these bipartisan accomplishments, because of his capacity of understanding, because of his leadership. So the opportunity to express that for four more years, what a gift it is for the American people. And as a Democrat, what a gift for me to make the case for the leader of our party, Joe Biden. Let's talk about you, Governor. Days after that special counsel report came out questioning the president's age and his memory, the Washington Post reported that anxious Democrats reached out to top Biden donors to ask, quote, when is Gavin getting in? Or how about Whitmer or Shapiro? The buzz has not stopped. I know you've been asked this before, but do you still rule out a run in 2024? Oh, you got to be kidding. I, I am here celebrating the extraordinary accomplishments of the Biden-Harris administration, making the case that we need to make to lift up the issues, lift up the record, drive contrast with the Republican nominee to be Donald Trump Have you so that any we calls? can win for four more years. Have you gotten any calls, Governor, on, encouraging I mean, you to it, run? It's all idle chatter. It's all, it's, you know what? That's a sideshow. I think what Democrats need to do is worry less, do more, continue to overperform as we have, continue to win, make the case. Don't be ashamed of 4.1 percent GDP over the last two quarters. Don't be ashamed about the alliance management of the Biden-Harris administration. Don't be timid about right. making the case for the record of this administration. So you're ruling it out 100 percent. I mean, it's not even an interesting conversation. Okay. And by the way, I think it's a damning conversation. Frankly, the other side wants us to have. And trust me, I know the Michigash coming from the other side. I'm deeply mindful of the anger machine and all the entertainment industry out there on Fox and elsewhere that love ginning this stuff up. At the end of the day, not only has this train left the station, but we are we get to enjoy a record of accomplishments as we make the case in a re-election, the likes of which we couldn't have even dreamt of, uh, even as a Democrat, the last century. Trump says he's ready to debate Biden right now. Should President Biden debate Of course he's Trump? not. I mean, he, uh, but should President Biden debate Biden Trump in the general? Biden beat Trump in the pr prior debates? I look forward to it. I mean, this is a guy, okay. by so the that's way, that's yes? just pure, 100 okay. percent, pure projection on a guy who refused to debate in his own primary. Back to my point, weakness masquerading as strength.
Let me ask you about uh, immigration very quickly. President Biden is reportedly considering taking executive action yep. that would restrict migrants from seeking asylum. Would you support that type of well, executive action? Well, you have to take, a, yeah, someone take, take a look at what governs executive the executive action is. It's a broad stroke. So before I sign off on any executive action, I'd like to know exactly what it is. But here's what I will say. Two things. The asylum system is broken. Everybody so you're open to it. it. You're the open to supporting him on this. The system is broken. We know it's game. The credible fear is, is, is manipulated. I don't think that. We know that as Democrats. I have the largest land port in the Western Hemisphere in the state of California. I'm going to be educated on this. I've brought the National Guard down to the border many years ago, increased their presence recently, and I applaud the president being willing to advance a bipartisan solution. The Republican Party is responsible today now for the conditions that persist because of their unwillingness to work with this president who went farther than any Democratic president in my lifetime yeah. on a comprehensive package. And Donald Trump called them and threatened them. It shows the weakness not only of Trump, so, but also of the Speaker of the House of Representatives. So, Governor, given that it is held up in Congress, there's no doubt about that. Do you want to see President Biden applaud, act? Should he take this action I applaud action the fact that he's willing asylums. to continue to move forward with this. I applaud the fact that he's seeking strategies and solutions. I applaud that he's been trying to do that. He's been trying to get 1,500 new Customs and Border agents on the border, 4,300 so new asylum yes? officers on the border. He wants... President Biden supported $650 million for more wall investment. That's the Biden... That's what Biden signed off on. So by definition... He wants to make progress on the border. And yes, by definition, I support his efforts outside of the legislative process because this legislature is broken. Congress is broken. All right. Well, we covered a lot of ground. Great to see <laughs> Good you. Good to see you. Governor Gavin Newsom, thank you so much for being here. Good to be back. And still ahead, our panel weighs in on the South Carolina results and looks ahead to Michigan. But when we come back, as the 2024 candidates make appeals to black voters, a look back at a presidential candidate who expanded the role of black voters. Our Meet the Press Minute is next. Welcome back. As we close out Black History Month, we look back to a barrier breaker in American politics, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. He launched his first presidential campaign in 1984, becoming only the second black American to mount a viable nationwide bid for the Democratic nomination. The Reverend Jackson joined our broadcast in the final days of his campaign, making clear that the struggle for racial equality would not be solved in a single election. We must put one foot in the system and one foot outside. We must fight for change. We cannot adjust the party. We must change the party. Got that right to vote 18 years ago after much bloodshed and, and death. And yet 18 years later, with this great brotherhood, there are 512,000 elected officials, about 5,200 are black. We've got about 1% of the elected officials. We're about 12% of the population. At this rate, it will take us 198 years to achieve parity. My generation is restless. We must change the system and not adjust to it. When we come back, how long will Nikki Haley stay in the race? And how worried should President Biden be about Michigan? The panel is next. Welcome back. The panel is here. NBC News chief political analyst Chuck Todd, NBC News Washington correspondent Yamish Alcindor, former Obama White House senior advisor Stephanie Cutter, and Lonnie Chen, a fellow at the Hoover Institution and Stanford University. Thank you all for being here after a late night, particularly for you, Chuck Todd, because you were just in New York tracking all of these results. Let's remind people of the results. Trump beat Haley in South Carolina by a 20 point margin and there's no way to sugarcoat it losing in your home state is devastating in yeah. 2016 you had john Kasich and ted cruz win their home states marco Rub win their home states but marco mm -hmm. rubio lost and got out what were your takeaways and what is haley's next move do you think I i'll tell you there's a, one the most remarkable number to me in the exit poll was 77 percent that was the percentage of folks who said they had made up their mind about who they were going to support mm. um before the start of this calendar year. So it meant only 30, and, 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 and Trump won 70% of those folks. So you, you only have essentially one in four Republican voters, because the South Carolina Republican electorate, I think, is, a, is, is closer to being a microcosm of sort of a generic Republican electorate 
than anything we've we've experienced so far. This yeah. is probably the most traditional so far. So it will it will be semi replicated, I think, through Super Tuesday. So what we're seeing here is Nikki Haley's trying to have this conversation about, are you sure you want to do this? And what about this? What about this? for the last two months she's been trying to have this conversation? And it turns out only one in four Republican voters are even listening to this conversation. Mm. So I think we have an idea of how Super Tuesday is going to go. Yeah. It's going to split pretty much like this. Will she do better in Virginia than South Carolina? Sure. And in Vermont? In Maine? Possibly. Maybe in Massachusetts. But it's probably, I think we, we, yeah. we know the contours of this divide inside the Republican Party. It's a divided party. It's just not evenly divided. It's a static party from the perspective of Nikki Haley. Right. They're not open to anyone beyond Trump. Yimish, I had the opportunity to interview Nikki Haley a couple weeks ago. I asked her, what did she need to do to stay in the race? She said she needed to exceed what she did in New Hampshire, in South Carolina. She didn't do that, but she's defiant. She's in this race. Do you think if she doesn't do well... Uh, in Super Tuesday, like Chuck's talking about. I mean, is that a moment where she's got to reevaluate and potentially get out? You would think that that would be a moment where she would reevaluate because by then the race is basically over. Um, she also told you that she would have to be building momentum yeah. and that it would have to be close in South Carolina for her to win. And obviously, as you just said, it's 20 points that she's losing by from former President Trump. I also think the story, as Chuck just pointed out, is in the exit polls. You see here people saying um, if that they believe that to Donald Trump is someone who could beat Joe Biden more than she could. The majority of voters mm. said that. They also pointed out that even when it comes to independents and moderates, who she won, they're the tiny, tiniest part of the GOP here. So you really have in the exit polls the answers to the questions. Now, Nikki Haley says she's still going to be staying in. She says it's not about her political future, but obviously this is politics. So part of this is when I talk to people, they think maybe she's looking at 2028. If Trump loses, they can say, well, Nikki Haley tried to warn us about this. Or she's someone who just wants to point out, hey, this is a party that needs to be redirected and we need to start thinking long term. But I think for Nikki Haley after Super Tuesday, it just seems really, really hard to justify to her and to her donors how she stays in. Well, Lonnie, 2028, I mean, if she doesn't drop out and endorse Trump, does she have a path to 2028 or is in this Republican Party or is that it? 2028 is a long time away. Yeah. And, and if you look back at what happened in 2016, and you look at the fact that Ted Cruz never endorsed Donald Trump in that yep. nominating process, and yet he is seen as somebody who is very much firmly in that camp. I, I don't know that we can make judgments about 2028 yet, but I would say two things generally keep candidates involved in races. One is politics, and the second is money. Uh, the money dynamic is very clear for Nikki Haley. She still has right. plenty of resources to run out this race, and she's continuing to raise a lot of money. I've talked to many donors uh, to her campaign who are interested in continuing to support her because they view that as a way to express a point of view. Whether she can win or not is kind of beside the issue. Yeah. It's We're expressing a point of view. Politically, that's where it gets more complicated for her, and arguably her staying in certainly through Super Tuesday and beyond, I don't think it affects her political calculus. Now, if she stays in till May and June, yeah. it may be a different conversation, but certainly until Super Tuesday, I think that's a yeah. perfectly reasonable thing. Yeah, Stephanie, I asked Gavin Newsom if Democrats wanted her to get out. He said, absolutely not. She's one of our best surrogates. Yeah. The argu arguments she's making on the campaign trail are precisely the arguments that Democrats, independents, uh, never Trumpers have been making for seven, eight years. Yeah. Um, you know, I do think it, it, as a Democrat, looking at these numbers and the results of these races, there is a strong never Trump um, contingent of the Republican Party. And the only way Trump wins in a general election is by delivering the Republican vote mm. and then suppressing certain parts of the Democratic vote. There are real questions about whether he is going to be able to turn out the Republican Party. Well, let's talk about one of the big contours of the general election. It is the issue of reproductive right. rights. And now we have this IVF ruling in Alabama. Stephanie, how significant is this? Because look at how quickly Republicans have come out, including Byron Donalds mm -hmm. today, to say, no, 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 we support IVF services. I might yeah. even sign a federal piece of legislation that would protect mm -hmm. them. They are the, the dog that caught the car. Yeah. And they have been fighting for decades uh, to overturn Roe, which is what Dobbs gave us. Uh, that Donald Trump brags about. He did that uh, by appointing um, uh, members of the Supreme Court. Um, but, you know, all of these members that rushed out to say, oh, we support IVF, they're the same members that are supporting legislation right now mm. that would ban IVF. Yeah. So, 
voters are smarter than this, and they've proven they're smart of the, smarter than this. Since Dobbs um, uh, came down, women have been turning out all over this country to say, these are our freedoms you're taking away. I think IVF really crystallizes it. Now, it was very much predicted. We knew this was going to happen. This is, not, this is not an isolated example. It's going to keep happening. And Republicans are going to keep tripping over this because their real position is that, yes, they do want to ban these things. Chuck, how do you see it playing out? Look, I think it's fascinating that in a Republican primary in these exit polls, we ask, you know, what's the most important issue? And abortion's always been one of the top four issues. And, you know, up until this year, when you saw abortion in a, a Republican pick abortion, it usually meant that they were, you know, on the, on the limiting side of access, the pro-life side, however you want to uh, characterize it. What was interesting here is in South Carolina, just 10 percent said abortion was the most important issue and a majority voted for Nikki Haley among mm. those. It tells you that this is, you know, 2022, those midterms, I think in 10 years from now, historians will look back, you know, we're sitting here going, was it these Trump nominees? No, that was a Dobbs election. Yes. And we may go, this may be a Dobbs decade. I there are times that I look at this electorate and I wonder, can the Republicans win a national election until they figure out their position on abortion? Well, yeah, and I don't they, know if they can. And they're all over the map in terms of messaging. They would acknowledge that. Yamish, you were on the ground in Alabama. What the human impact of this cannot be underscored. The trauma that I talked to um, when, I, when I witnessed women say that they spent years and thousands and thousands of dollars preparing for IVF only to get calls from their doctors the day before that their procedures um, were canceled. People are going to remember that no matter what happens with the legislation. And let's remember, Republicans took a week for this, for them to really coalesce around the idea that they supported IVF. And it's like I they was had to in check IVF. with the groups to yeah. see what they could I, say. I was in an IVF clinic where one of the doctors told me she was having the hardest conversations of her life. I saw her physically feel relief when mm. Donald Trump said that he was wow. going to come out. But she said it was head spinning to think that politics was the reason why she can now tell her, her, her patients that they can have their dreams again, that they won't be crushed. I, Lonnie? I was going to say, I think we've seen a shift in where the energy is here, right? The energy now, I think, if you look at turning out voters and you look at the enthusiasm gap, one of the issues you see is how Democrats have used this issue really to shape the electorate into an electorate that's favorable to political outcomes, whether it's in congressional seats, gubernatorial races, or indeed the presidential contest. So for Republicans, messaging around and having a conversation on this issue what Byron Donalds did was exactly right, which is yeah. you've got to come out in favor of really a really strong effort on IVF, yeah. I think, nationally, and that's where they've yeah. got to be. All right. And all of this, the backdrop to Michigan on Tuesday. Thanks, folks. That is all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week, because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.